please replace the speaker on its rack when you're ready to leave. Failure to do so will damage both the speaker and your car. We'll be grateful, and so will the patrons who follow you. The moment our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been urbanly waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for... T.M.I. Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your hosts. Jeff Nerf Herder Chandler. Jim Kaiju Baker. And Christina Yojimbo Henry. You can continue. Now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. The fact that it had um, the like the meta narrative yeah, around yeah. alien abductions and uh-huh. how all these alien abductions start to sound like the one in communion after communion comes out. Well, I think that yeah, that's um anyway, it's that's very interesting to me well since we've ushered in the crypto keeper into our episode you know one of the movies we're doing is everything everywhere all at once Mm -hmm. so and the reason we're doing it today is because it's on streaming so when i went on amazon and i purchased it because you can't rent it yet you can only no 1999 1999 so i went through all the new releases you know purchase or rent and one of them was a new bigfoot movie so if you go all the way over to the right past what's on your screen there is a new Bigfoot documentary. It's not one of these hokey horror movies. It's an actual in search of type documentary. So, Jeff, I thought that you maybe were aware or you've mm, seen it or what? I, I may. What's the what's the title of it? I, I don't do remember. To, I, I just was, remember Bigfoot and uh, documentary. Amazon, Amazon yeah. like lines those things up for me. Like I go, I have a whole subcategory in Amazon. I believe it was a 2022 release. So I just you know oh. thought that you would be all over it by i probably time. have watched it i can't i don't know off the top of my head what what the name it was is. a very esoteric title as well i just it's not coming to me at the moment okay all right well i hope that you guys have uh your what else you did this week sorted i could come up with one of those at a moment's <laughs> oh, notice can, so don't I, worry I, i'm gonna tell you right now i know exactly what uh christine is going to talk about you do maybe maybe <laughs> I threw it out there, and if I'm right, I'm right. If I'm not, uh, it was a good guess. Jeff's like, I can't. That's at the end, though. Now. Stay tuned for what else we did this week. Mm-hmm. What else did we do? But let's start with the news, right? Wait, wait. We are uh, officially talking everything, everywhere, all at once. But what are we pairing this up with? Oh, welcome everybody! Mm-hmm. Once again, we're in the middle. <laughs> we just, you yeah. know, if you just pressed play blindly and you didn't look at the. Mm-hmm the title of this episode we are pairing it with kung fu hustle some people who actually subscribe like when i listen to my podcast i don't look at what the title is it's like oh new episode dropped this week and i just listen to it so yeah there could be people oh, i love i no love to think that that just blow oh, up these guys i'm listening yeah <laughs> i don't no, care no what's that anything they say yeah uh, all right so we're gonna talk kung fu hustle on the back end so, uh, yes, we do have a little bit of news, so uh, we'll get into it. Um, this is actually going out to my buddy, Rich, who does listen to us religiously, but he has purposely not listened to our Spider-Man No Way Home yet because he has not seen it. He is Come on. He is one of the few people on the planet, and he claims that it has not been spoiled for him, which I am just blown away, but it is getting a re-release in the theaters. Well, this is specifically for him. Darth Vader, yeah, maybe the only one. <laughs> Darth oh, no. Vader is Luke oh. Skywalker's uh, second cousin, half removed. Mm, former roommate. <laughs> uh, this is referred to as the more fun stuff version. And Sony is re releasing this, Marvel's re releasing this uh, in theaters September 2nd with additional footage. So if you haven't seen it yet, you can go and see this or uh, you can uh, go watch it again because I think it is streaming, right? It is streaming. Right. Absolutely. Well, here's here's my take on it, which is they are now sitting at number three in domestic box office gross of all time. And they're only like 54 million below 
uh, end game. I think they're just looking to bump their numbers. That's all they're doing. Yeah. They've got, they've got added footage, you know, that usually ends up on the, on the back end of a Blu-ray disc and they're just adding it back in. They're actually referring to this as a fan cut. So did like some fan get a hold of this and just cut it together and be like, Oh, I want to see this. So it is being re-released back in the theater and uh, it'll probably climb to number two. Do you want any, uh, any guesses as to what the number one, this is all factoring in uh, inflation and all whatnot. Number one uh, box office gross of all time movie. Domestic right. only? Uh, this is domestic. Yes, correct. I'll give you a hint. It came out in 2015. Was it the first Avengers movie? No. No. I don't remember guesses? when that came out. No. Drawn a blank. Star Wars The Force Awakens. Oh, you know, it's funny. I should have known that because this came up in the context of Jurassic World this week, Mm. where my son and I were talking about how 2015 was like this sudden slew of like reboots and requels. And we were talking about Force Awakens and we're talking about Jurassic World. They both came out 2015 and Creed Mm -hmm. also Mm. came out that year. Yeah. Now we're seeing this whole re. This whole surge of legacy characters. Now, this is funny yeah. that you should mention this type of a conversation because mm-hmm. years and, you know, thinking about in regards to when things came out and all that, oh, that was a good year. That ended for me like around 1999. Everything has yeah, well, blended into itself. I couldn't yeah, tell you stopped. what was released in 2015. It's, you know, that's funny because uh, we were with a bunch of people, uh, most who I've only met once or twice, and we got talking about. Uh, movies and the fact that I can usually nail the release date just with the title. And yeah, it, when you start getting into the 2000s, it's all just a big murky, bloody mess. I'm like, ah, 2005 or 2020. I don't remember. So, anyway, so if anyone's excited, that is being released back in the theater. Uh, and uh, Christina, you'll be excited for this, which is um, Scooby Doo, the live action 20th anniversary is coming up. And yeah. Airbnb is celebrating by offering up a one night stay in the mystery machine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is going to be in Malibu, California. Mm-hmm. Matthew Lillard is actually going to he's promoting this. And I guess he's going to do. Some is, he, kind of, is he the concierge for the night? <sighs> he does greet you in the video screen. Right. Um, so it's just the van. You're basically sleeping in the van. Um, and it's only costing you $20 a night, but the caveat is this, there's only two people, which makes sense since it's a van and it's only going to be happening for three nights, June 24th, 25th and 26th in Malibu, California. This is an adults only prospect. Well, I, yeah, I mean, unless you, you know, dad's going to take his kids, but it's all you can eat snacks. There's going to be mystery games. And then obviously there's going to be a Scooby-Doo viewing. Mystery but it's just going to be hey. it's just going to be 20 bucks. All I have to say is if the van is a rocking, wow. don't come knocking. <laughs> Red one raggy. <laughs> uh, and the Scooby Doo was actually out last night. So I was watching it and I'm like, I don't remember any of this except for the fact that Scrappy Doo was the bad guy at the end. Oh, the live action one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I still prefer watching like any animated movie to oh, the, I agree. To yeah. the live action yes. one. Yeah. But um, I actually feel like the second one was closer in vain to the cartoons than the first one. I mean, don't get me started on how great Mystery Incorporated is. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. This just br- brings back a story. Um, I was sitting at my desk at work one day and there was a guy that was sitting on the other side of the partition for me. I couldn't see him, but I could hear his phone conversation. And this is oh, right no. when the first Scooby-Doo came out. And needless to say, he doesn't work um at my job anymore. But the conversation was all about the first Scooby-Doo. And he was like, dude, Scooby-Doo. Number one this weekend, all time. And I don't know exactly what the um, particulars were, but apparently for that weekend, the opening gross did set some kind of a record. And he repeated at least four times. Dude. All time. No, no. All time. I'm telling you. Until all tomorrow. time. And that, I just leaned over and I said, did you tell him? All time? <laughs> Are you being busy? Just- Is he that concerned that he misheard you? 
So there you go. That that's uh, those are my only two news items. Should we get into everything? We we're, talk, we're talking hold on, everything. Hold on. I, I got to just prepare myself. OK, let's go. <laughs> uh, it's really too bad. This isn't this isn't a, a visual feed. <laughs> this isn't a visual medium. I, not, I swear to So I slapped an eyeball. I thought I could have swore my kids have a whole bunch of like craft stuff in the closet. We have to have googly eyes somewhere. Mm-hmm. I tore this closet apart. I got glitter all over the place. My wife is laughing. She's taking pictures and sending it to my kids. Look what your dad just did. You just turned your back to the camera and we're dabbing your head. I thought you were sweating at this early I into am, the episode. I am sweating. <laughs> it is very hot in here. Usually I have my fan on. Oh, if my third eye blinks out, uh, just to call someone mm. to resuscitate me here. The amount of work that Jeff went through just to have a one second joke on us. <laughs> Listen, just, it's just, all for the joke. Just for our and benefit. Nobody can just see for the so two of us. Matter, but it made you chuckle. That's all. <laughs> this is the only reason I do this show is to make you laugh. <laughs> so uh, I'm out of here. Mic drop. Boop. Everything, sure. everywhere, all at once. We've been talking about this for a very long time. Yes, and it is finally on streaming. So I think Christina um, saw it like a year and a half ago. Year and a half ago. Did you watch it again for this episode? I did watch it again because I, spoiler alert, I loved it. Um, I saw this movie the first week it came out. So I saw it in March. The day after I saw it, I think you were on vacation, Jeff, and I was talking to Jim and I said that for the first time in such a long time, I felt like I was having like a really ecstatic experience at the movie theater. The theater yeah. I love films where the filmmakers take big chances. I want to see a movie where people take risks and go out there and try to really do something different, something that you haven't seen before. And um, this film sort of hits all of those buttons for me. It was a packed theater. I will note, though, this is a rated R film, and there was a couple in front of us who taught who brought their two pretty nice. young children. Wow. <laughs> and there were a few apparently scenes. they thought it would they thought it was an MCU movie. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this, is, this has to be tied into Loki somehow. <laughs> there were a few older. scenes. The little girl looked like she was about seven. There was a few scenes where I just really hoped that she didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. Well, there are yeah. some, oh, I know what you're there are about. some, yeah. no, 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 no. There are some visceral um, visuals in this. Yeah. So I don't know if you could mistake what was movie, going on. I hope this movie changed that little girl's life. And she's like, this is, this is art. This is what. Yes. Was, was there at least a parental hand over the eyes? No. Yeah. The dad was no? covering his eyes. No. <laughs> dad, I'm afraid. Just watch, just watch it. Yeah. Uh, note to Marvel. This is how you multiverse. Yeah. I mean, this, this movie is, is amazing. Well, ahead, well this, this is, is uh, produced well, by the Russo brothers. So it does have a Marvel connection in yeah. some way. It could. Yeah. You could argue that it may be taking place in the MCU. It could easily. The, the ideas, the concepts are, are the same. They're the multiversal hey, concept. The concept, but the execution is... It's Brilliant. very different. It's very the, different. The, the execution on this, the artistic integrity, and you know, I'm reading a bunch on on the tech because this has got to be an editorial nightmare to edit this stuff together. And we'll get it on the back. Nine people, including the directors, did all the special effects themselves. Five full time. None of them had any uh, FX experience. These guys were like googling youtube videos and how to do this stuff <laughs> well executed it well is i a think beautiful it, it is and the special effects are amazing and the, the 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 concept is just head turning but what sets it apart i think is the characters and the journey of evelyn and that's done very nicely yeah so yeah. it could be, you know, it's it's besides the point that there's all these amazing visuals and everything going on. Oh, no, they tie yeah. it into a you great to, story. Right. That's what makes it so. Yeah, you good. need to care about these characters in order to make this work, especially the relationship between, um, you know, the two the two parents. And like it's so much of it is rooted in Evelyn's relationship with Joy. And in so many ways, like. Evelyn's character is such a very typical middle-aged woman where she's trying to do so many things and she's Mm -hmm. not doing any of them well because she can't give anything her full attention, Uh you know, and she's trying to be a caregiver to her father 
who rejected her earlier in her very life. Very demanding old man, by the way. Yes. <laughs> she's trying to long. she's trying to still care for her daughter, but she's not doing that well. You know, no, she, but the kid's also at a very rebellious age. Right. So she's trying to take yeah. care of her business. She's trying to plan this party. You know, they have this IRS audit. She has a million things to do. And her husband's just trying to get her attention. And she's that's all because that's what we do. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about mm. us. We're selfish jerks. <laughs> Pay attention to me. Look at me. I'm over here. Stop. Stop. What you're she's, doing. Look at me. she's overwhelmed. She's overwhelmed yeah. by her life. I mean, and she's and you, questioning and, and she's questioning. You, you see that all play out in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. You, but the beautiful thing exactly. is, it's like it, the, the husband, uh, Waymond, isn't like, you know, this sad sack who's you, you feel sorry for because he's in the same boat. He's yeah. unhappy as well. And he's actually going to serve her with papers because of it yeah. to do something yeah. about the situation that they're in. And he's very sorrowful about it. You know, maybe he's gone uh, a few steps too far because it seems like he hasn't even discussed this with her and he's got the divorce can we, papers. Can, in his can someone give me a proper pronunciation for this actor's name, by the way? It's Kihi Kwan. Mm -hmm. uh, this is short round from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yeah. Or Data from Goonies. Data from Goonies. Where has this guy been for the last 30 years? Because He's... he kills it in this movie. So I loved him. He chose to take time off of acting. He worked as a stuntman. A long time off. From yeah, I know. <laughs> but he chose to take time off of acting. And part of it was that he said that there aren't a lot of a lot great of roles. roles for Asian actors. And it's yeah. true. And it, he's so good in this. Yeah. And there's Fantastic. so many things that I love about his character, including in so many ways, he's a flip of the kind of masculine character that you normally see in movies where he's he's very <clears throat> relentlessly positive, you know, and he's tr in the end, he actually the the whole denouement hinges on his speech about being kind to one another yes yeah. but that kill is, him that with is kindness a, but kill that him is with the kindness we should all adhere to <laughs> well it's and, nice yeah. because it's you know the solution isn't like beat your problem into submission which is the solution of every marvel movie right it's wow well, well like, when you yeah, got a hammer and a shield that's what you gotta do it's, let's not <laughs> beat the problem into submission you know let's Let's be kind to one another. Let's love each other. Well, this I is actually um, where Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Deirdre, she's, I think Jamie Lee Curtis is a revelation in this movie. She's yeah. amazing. But she's so hurting inside, you know, in all of her iterations. She feels so unloved. Yeah. And the fact that she feels unloved, like drives so many of the things that she does. Yeah, I liked it that she didn't just turn into a caricature, like every iteration of her, like even in the reality that we're familiar with, that we start off with, where she's the worst, where she's just auditing them and is, are going to take them through the legal hoops. She gives them two second chances, even in that reality. Yeah. yeah. And it's partially because Waymond shows her kindness, right? He brings her cookies and with those little smiley faces on them. And she also sees that she has much in common with Evelyn. Yeah. And she's like, when my husband served me papers, I drove the car into the mm -hmm. kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. It's like once you know her history in this universe and in the other universes, too, you really see how her loneliness drives her and drives her actions. The whole thing, all these characters are existing in a space, but none of them are connecting. You know, Joy doesn't feel connected to Evelyn. Evelyn doesn't feel connected to Joy. Evelyn and Wayman don't feel connected to one another. And poor uh, Gong Gong. Nobody feels connected <laughs> to him. <laughs> yeah, no. Right. Well, and he had rejected Evelyn for marrying Wayman. Yeah. You know, and she was so hurt by that because her father let her go. So they're all sort of existing in this physical space, but they're not together emotionally. And that's really what this movie does is it's about the journey that they all have to take to in order to connect with one another. Again. Yes. And they have to do that through uh, various multiverses as well. So like I was saying, this could be an MCU story, you know, just turned on its head. There is uh, a being traveling through the multiverse that apparently from what Evelyn is being told wants to end everything. Jobu, Tupaki. Now, mm -hmm. this could be Kang. You know, this could be a yeah, variation yeah, of no. Kang, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, Jobu 
is joy. So <laughs> the physical manifestation of Jobu is joy. The, the way that this, the multiverse here is set up is that these characters, uh, Evelyn's husband of Wayman comes to her from another reality during their audit. And Alpha says Wayman. That she is the one. It's like, Alpha, you know, yeah. Neo in the Matrix. You're the yeah, one. Say, there, there is a ton of Matrix references in this. Mm-hmm. And they, as there are in Kung Fu Hustle, which is great. Yeah. But you're the one and uh, you're the Evelyn that we're looking for to save the multiverse, the realities. And so he gives her like a really quick lesson about the multiverse. You know, we can jump into bodies like I'm jumping into your husband's body in this reality, but I'm coming from another reality where you discovered the multiverse and you're no longer alive. And Gong Gong is also in with Waymond in uh, in the command truck or whatever they're in, in the in their multiverse. So that's where really where it goes from. So you're now looking at these same characters that you've been introduced to jumping into their bodies from other universes. So they become, they're still the same, but they're different iterations of that character. And the Evelyn int- is seeing different versions of herself at the same time. The interesting thing about the reason why he chooses this Evelyn is because as he says you're living the worst you right (laughs) great like every failure that she's ever had everything she ever tried branched off into another universe where she became successful at that thing this is heartbreaking when she see when she sees like like she literally at one point comes back and she says to her husband I saw my life without you and it was fantastic (laughs) and she asks one of the Waymans, can I just go back to where like the movie star was? I want to be that. Evelyn's like, no, no, Which no. I thought was brilliant because that is like footage of her probably crouching tiger head. Yeah. Or something, <laughs> winning an award. <sighs> but the beautiful I, thing about it is that it, later on, it's like, well, the, you had failures, because, but it all came to this moment. You wouldn't have come to this moment without these failures, you know, and it's an acceptance of her life. I love that other universe where she, where Evelyn becomes Michelle Yeoh, basically, right? She becomes a glamorous movie star. And Waymond basically becomes Tony Lung in a Wong Kar Wai movie. <laughs> this is like, He's of, of all suave. of the, yeah. the alternate universes, this is like one of my favorites. That you like and, the hot dog finger universe? Well, I was going to say that and the, um, the Rakakuni with Rocket Harry Shum yes, Jr. That, that needs to be discussed at <laughs> length. Do you, do you know that that was Randy Newman that did the voice of the record? You could tell it was yeah. his voice and, and the songs. Great. Well, yeah, the song makes perfect singing. sense. Yeah. And I love everything bagels, but this takes it to a whole new level. <laughs> so. I love that when... Evelyn's trying to explain about Rakakuni and she has Joy taped to the chair and Becky calls and she's like, my mom taped me to the chair because of raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Her mistaking Ratatouille for mm-hmm. Rakaku. So that would have been enough. Like, I thought that was great. But then the fact that they expand yeah. upon that multiple times, it keeps coming back. So there's a reality where there is a Rakakuni, where it's a raccoon controlling the chef instead of a little rat. And there's when Evelyn goes into that reality and sees him for the first time in the kitchen and the raccoons on his head, he goes, the raccoon tells the chef, kill her. She's seen too much. (laughs) (laughs) There are so many throwaway little sight gags and jokes in this. This is, this is a gift. I I immediately wanted to rewatch this as soon as I was done. Well, here's the thing. That was the issue that I had with it is that it was, it was almost like a, a, the greatest sumptuous dinner that you can imagine, but it was too much for you to eat at that time. You're going to have to come back to it. It is very long. I will say that against it, it is like, because it's broken up into the three chapters, everything, everywhere, all at once. And when we get to the second chapter, I'm like, we're only on the second chapter here. It, it is much. The but third yeah. chapter is short. But still, it is a long movie. But I think it pays off. I like, I think, oh, it, don't, I think, that, it, I think I, that gonna, it earns the, the length. Did you appreciate yeah, it more the second it, viewing? And like Jeff said, there's so many things to kind of look at and see um, things that like you just would miss the first time around. Even just a little thing, like in the first shot of the alpha verse, when the van is driving on the road, there's a sign that says hail bagel, <laughs> which yeah, I didn't yeah. catch right. the first time. And even if I did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have made any sense because you didn't yeah. about seen the, the everything bagel yet. But yeah, there's so many things to see and so many things to look at. And the thing that you really appreciate You certainly appreciate it the first time, but really the second time around is how physical the roles are for everyone. And by that, I don't just mean like the action and the fighting, but how the physicality of each actor changes based on whatever 
person they're seeing they're they're playing um especially obviously stephanie hu when she's playing joe butapaki her body language and her attitude is completely different than when she's joy she's completely transformed into a different person she goes, Joy, that you? Why you look so stupid? <laughs> mm. <laughs> all up. She and comes out with the pig. <laughs> the pig. I did like the um at the beginning, the uh, the girl that comes in the customer with the little dog to get her clothes and it Jenny was, Slate. The tag was the tog, the tag was 42. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice little uh mm-hmm. hitchhiker's guide reference there. And then I love it when she's fighting Jenny Slate's character, who she refers to as Big Nose. The scene is funny because they keep Evelyn keeps doing more and more ridiculous things. And Joy and Waymond are watching this and they're like, what is she doing? They're like, I think that if she does something weird, that she gets more power. So then they start throwing out suggestions like right. dude, jumping <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> now this you got to explain this to me because this kind of got lost. Evelyn seems to be able to do anything weird and it triggers. It's like a jump pad or a leap pad, as they call it, to leap into another reality. But the others have to do something specific that they're told to do. You know, so they could do anything else as well, right? Any if it's stupid, they don't have to jump on a plug up their posterior <laughs> buttocks. <laughs> that so, was a little disconcerting. By the way. So Waymond explains that it's like about probabilities, right? So when she initially is learning, he gives her like three options, right? She can tell Deirdre that she loves her. She has to mean it. She can take a nap (laughs) and he's like, do you feel like napping right now? But it's somehow about like probabilities is not just about like a really weird thing. But I think as it goes along and Evelyn starts to gain control, basically as she becomes more like Joy slash Jobu Tapaki, she doesn't need the same degree of extreme probability the other characters do in order yeah. to access those abilities because she's already starting to access all of her selves everywhere just like joy is i did read the directors at one point were leaning toward uh having evelyn uh have undiagnosed adhd which gave her this distracted ability to be able to somehow tap into this other universe mm. but i don't it, it never plays out in the movie itself they don't really go down that road but yeah no once she realizes or figures out how she can do that then then it's like game on what's interesting is i was listening to an interview with michelle yo right after this movie came out and she was talking about how one of the reasons why she wanted to do this film was because it was so counter to so many other things that she does she's like i i'm always asked to play this sort of like serious elegant kind of character and then she went blah 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 you know and you could just Mm. tell that she was like sick of playing that one type of person and that this role really gave her a chance to do something very different although obviously like she's done a lot of martial arts and other films so that part wasn't uh new for her no Mm. but it's new for the character so it's fun when she learns it and you watch her unfold this especially with the pinky yeah, you know, that whole scene. Yeah, that was great. Whenever you know, she brought out the pinky. That fanny pack fight was, and he did most of those stunts himself, by the yeah. way. Well, yeah, that was undeniable, was right? Because I'm looking at him like, that is him. That's well, him. He's and, doing and, this. There are some cheats where they 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 CG'd his face onto the stunt double, but I think he did like 80% of those stunts himself. Mm. But yeah, whether or not you, you realize that the actor can or can't do those, it's fun to see these characters tap into this and become those type of characters and what's fun for me is and this happens in most fantastic fish out of water type things where the character has to invest in what's being told to him or her when Wayman from the other universe is trying to tell her about jobu and she's like you're just making up sounds now you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah i don't i don't think you could properly describe this to somebody and i don't think it's for everyone Unfortunately, IMDb, there's plenty of detractors out there. Someone referred to this as a very bad Rick and Morty episode. So very taking, bad take, Rick and Morty episode. That's yeah. harsh. Yeah, it is harsh. Is that just like um, a view? Th- that's not like a real reviewer, though, right? That's just I don't know. They, they, listen, anybody who can post something on, you know, that's the whole point of IMDb. Yeah. For what it's worth, when I saw this in the movie theater, like half the theater spontaneously burst out applauding at the end of the film. So, but I think when you see when people know, you know, when you go to the theater, 
and yeah. you're going to invest your money, you kind of know what you're getting in for. This is my type of movie. There are other people who, you know, either whatever why you're there paying there people who yeah, i was gonna or, say they choose to buy a, a film that yeah they know well sometimes about. people you know sometimes people are like oh it's gotten great reviews let's let's go watch it mm -hmm. christina i think that you ran into some of those people yesterday judging from the text that we got <laughs> um well, around you're talking Jur Jurassic World, let's talk so about that next week though audience. but um <laughs> but i think that you had the advantage because like you said you saw this on opening weekend so you still had even though obviously you knew what you were about to see, you knew what it was about, you had that sense of discovery and you come out of this wanting to tell the world, you know, and that's our disadvantage where the world already loves it. So we're in a way jumping on the bandwagon, right? Jeff and I, we've finally seen it. That's probably well, a little harsh to it. say, but I could have walked. Listen, again, it depends. Sometimes you get, you're in a bad mood and you're just like, I, I don't want to pay attention to this. I don't want to, it's too much. But that extra oomph of, you know, knowing something that the rest of the world doesn't, you've, you've got that advantage already. I like, yeah. <laughs> I really wish I had seen this in the theater. I wanted um, you guys to see. It yeah, no, so unfortunately, bad. it just the window just kind of came and went. And by yeah. the time, uh, you know, it's so we funny because it's literally still playing here in the theater. It's well, like, you're also yeah. in the heart of a major. Yeah. Metropolis. You know, I would have to go all the way up to where Jim is in, in Poughkeepsie to watch it. And it was like a 10 o'clock show at night on a weekday. That ain't going to happen. Yeah, I just wish you guys could have seen it in the theater. Mm -hmm. well, here's the deal. A... I now pay $19.99 for it and I will watch this again. Yeah. The one thing I thought was really neat, we mentioned the googly eyes and, and um, you know, this is what he's doing, which is he's trying to, to just make lighthearted the, the dad, uh, Wayman, just trying to make lighthearted moments, you know, putting googly eyes on things that just, you know, if you get a chuckle out of somebody, then so be it. Uh, but it's it's the yin and yang of the black bagel with the white center. And then you got the Google eyes, which is white with a black center. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, they counteracts each other. Yeah. And like you said, you know, not to spoil anything, but it's the uh, the goodness of uh, yeah. the googly eyes. I don't really think we have during this conversation spoiled anything. So if anybody's not seen this yet. Oh, absolutely. Yourself a favor. Think, go watch I, it. If you haven't picked up on it, I think we're all going to heartily recommend this. Mm -hmm. So um, I think so much about it is constantly unexpected. You know, yeah, because even like I said, you, you get into it and you see this, you see Evelyn's world and what's going on. And no sooner do they get into the IRS and she's confronted with this. And all of a sudden she's faced with this Morpheus. Take the red pill or the blue pill. You can either sit here or you can go into that closet. You know, you're right there with the character. What the hell's going on? What what what? Why is he suddenly acting differently? Yeah, it's a fun ride. It's a it's a fantastic fun ride. It is. It is. It's been doing great. And the reason it's still in theaters is because people are going to see it. Uh, and I think that is word of mouth. I think exactly what you were saying before, Jib, which is people are seeing this and coming out going, you have to go see this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just in the first fight with Jibu Tapaki when she comes out and she starts fighting the cop, it, she turns him into confetti. You just didn't expect that, right? No, and that reminds me. Then she turns the other cop into Carmen Miranda or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, and then he gets shot in slow motion, which is. <laughs> there There are a lot of laugh out loud moments. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of others like, wait, what did I just miss? Yeah. Although the, the hot dog finger universe, I, it's just when they're shoving fingers into each other's mouth. I'm like, all right. I'm did dead. they have mustard for blood? Is that was that the story? <laughs> when did they bite into the fingers and then mustard would come out? <laughs> Is that is that how hot dogs work? Again, it's so random, you yeah. know. And it's... but I mean, the right. So so their fingers are hot dogs, so they can't operate. So now they're doing everything with their feet. Yep. And and, and there's no explanation. Nope, it just is. You know, and, it and almost she, seems like whatever reality she thinks of, she creates because the rack hakuni thing, you know. <laughs> well, I, I guess if you're going to believe in the idea of a multiverse, any conceivable version is out there. Yeah. So if you, you know? think it, that it's out there, that that's what she's going to there could be a go to. Yeah. And another metaverse where the three of us all have hot dog noses or whatever or yes. whatever. So uh, so it was a hit. Twenty five million budget. And it's made 81 so far. Um, it is the most profitable movie that A24 has put out. Can you explain to me why A24 gets a bad rap? Because anytime I see somebody talk about an A24 movie, they're like, oh, I hate that studio. 
they they produce nothing but crap. It's a very bizarre thing to say it is, because because I'm like that's that's like right. saying I hate Universal Studios right. because it's of like all the, the crap it's movies like they the put out. The minute they see a studio stamp on the front of a movie, they're like, yeah. I'm not Why? Because it's this. pretentious or what? I don't know. That's I what think I'm, that they have a very specific kind of film that they release, like. Hereditary was A24. Uncut okay, Gems is A24. Yeah, but I heard that was great. I mean, um, are, like, Men, which I just saw, is ben, A24. Ben, ben. How was um, that, by the way, since we're not going to re- review uh, it? I'll talk about it later. Ooh. Yeah, when we do, when we do what we did, what else? Damn it, that's not what I thought you were going to talk about. <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> Jeff, did you realize that uh, Harry Shum Jr., who plays the chef in the Rakakuni bits, is from Glee? Yes. I'm yeah. like, because I thought this guy looks yeah. familiar. What yeah, do I, I know. know him from? Yeah. And then but again, but but I will say normally when we watch a movie, especially at home, I am pausing. I am making notes. I get distracted because I'm writing notes while I'm watching this movie. I did not do that at all for this. And again, the weekend comes and goes. And, you know, to invest in a two and a half hour movie, actually, you know, after working 12, 14 hours. And I'm like, I'm just going to put this movie on because if mm-hmm. I got to pay for it and worst case, I fall asleep. I'll finish watching it the next day. I was so invested and I did never pick up my phone once. I just experienced it. That's a good because that was what one of the reasons why I wanted you guys to see it in the in theater, the theater it is because is it's a different unless it, because unlike it's, Jim who takes notes in the theater. Because because <laughs> then you, pause you have the experience of watching the film the way that creator intended in one unbroken spool and that was so i'm glad that you're able to do that yeah the, the tough part is you know coming out and remembering everything and then writing it down and now you got to do your research and you're like you know you brought up something i'm like oh yeah i completely forgot about that carmen miranda you know cop fight thing. yeah well that's why i you was know, saying it's do- like a it's like a great meal that's just too much for you to, to eat yeah. i watched it all in one sitting i didn't mean that it's too much for you to watch at one time it's too much to ingest to digest you know, yeah. and and yeah. retain yeah, I agree. It, um, is, it is it is wild, and the imagination on this is off the charts. Um, I just wanted to mention that the directors it's must must have been like corralling cats, as the saying goes, to try to direct something like this. Uh, the Daniels, because it's Daniel plural, so they've just shortened their collective name to Daniels, Dan Quan and Daniel Shiner. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe Uh, the funny thing is we're talking about, you know, obviously you you can't really talk about this without bringing in uh, mentioning the MCU multiverse. And now DC is doing multiverse movies as well. Um, Rick and Morty is another example. Jeff mentioned that, but they got frustrated as they were making this because the multiverse in all these other iterations kind of was seeping into pop culture. Yeah. So they were frustrated in that, you know, this that they'd been working on for so long. Apparently Marvel like, does not own the license, right? No, that. they don't own the, the no. idea license for this. But um, is Evelyn a mutant? They got frustrated that it would seem like that they were riding the coattails of these other things. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that uh, Aquafina dropped out at one point. Didn't say what she was going to play. I assume Joy. Joy. Because um, yeah. that's right around her age range. I thought Stephanie shoot. Oh yeah, no, amazing. not to take nothing away. Oh yeah, from no, her. I think the casting wise, I think this is this is absolutely brilliant. If I thought even she Gong was Gong, wonderful. who almost seems like a throwaway role, you know, James he steps Hong. up there. James Hong steps up there at the end. You know, As I sent you guys a thing recently, he became the oldest actor to ever receive a star in Hollywood Walk of Fame. How is it That's- that he had this long? Come ridiculous, on. right? That's ridiculous. Come on. He should have gotten one at low pan. <laughs> that, uh, That's what my husband said too. <laughs> well, my husband's yeah. a big fan of Lopez. <laughs> like oh, say, imagine you know, if they went to a universe that was Big that Trouble in Little China, and we been, saw Lopan. You know, that's <laughs> funny because they did do a, at one point. Uh, uh, Waymont, he was like, uh, "Snap out of it!" And I'm like, "Oh, that is such a short round Indiana Jones reference right there." When uh, Indy was being possessed by uh, Muller Ram. Did you guys watch Go the to- um, blooper reel on your? No. I your special not. features there no. i forget that there's special features now it's about an eight minute long blooper reel it's really fun but one of the things is ki hu kwan is talking to the actress who plays becky and they're eating noodles and he's like indiana jones and the temple of zoom is the greatest movie ever made isn't it <laughs> <laughs> very cool i did see it's there's different titles for this in different countries and i don't remember what country this was but the translation basically says mystical woman warrior f- the universe is the title and i'm like that's that's pretty spot on that's yeah (laughs) what country can get away with that i don't know (laughs) for the most part reviewers are just falling over themselves giving this praise 
besides you know the one maybe that you brought they, up. Maybe they Jeff, have hot but... dog toes. <laughs> My favorite was from Indie Wire, an orgiastic work of slap happy genius. <laughs> well, I couldn't even come up with that. I really <laughs> felt That's like good. I was walking on air when I walked out of the theater yeah, after yeah. seeing this. Just especially because there had been a, like a pretty long streak before that where I'd mentioned to you guys like we keep we kept watching movies and I was like, ah, eh, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. Eh, it was okay. Yeah. Like, it was okay. Yeah. You know, we saw so many movies in a row where I just sort of felt meh about Blech. them. Not that they were bad, but they just didn't move me. And this moved me so, so much. It's very life affirming when you walk out. It, it is, <laughs> you know, you talk about it before, which is, you know, the, the Deirdre character. And when we first meet her, she's really kind of a bitch. And then you realize, but that's life. I mean, you have to realize, you know, a person is the way they are for a certain reason. And you want to start digging into their past and realize why you act a certain way. That's exactly why she does what she does. Right. You can't um, destroy people's lives. And but she's not really not that way because she does give two two different chances. She does right. have a, you know, a, a kind streak in her. Right. And then at the end, when Wayman tells her, you know, like, I just gave Evelyn divorce papers and that may be why she's acting this way. And then she's like, OK, you have another chance. You have yeah. like a, yeah. a week to yeah. to do this because, you know, she remembers how she felt when that happened to her. So it is it's ve- it's a very, very. You can get caught up in the pyrotechnics of it, but it's a very moving film at its heart. And I think that's why it works. Yeah, like I said, if you don't care about these characters, it doesn't matter how much, you know, special effects or whatever they throw at you. All right. What kind of buckets would we give everything, everywhere, all at once? We give it the everything bucket? Everything bucket? I see you. I see you. Christina. Are you going five on this? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it's pretty close. I don't know if I'm yeah. willing to give it five buckets right away, but I will go four and three quarters. It's too long. That is the one detraction I will say is it. It's a little much, but uh, it's a hell of a journey. I'll give it four because, like, like I said, it was. I think it was too much to ingest all at once. The first time you got to earn a five bucket over time. And Christina's already seen it twice. So um, yes. I completely understand <laughs> if that's her verdict. But um, yeah, I'm going to go with four on my first feeling. I really loved it. I really did. And I, I really appreciated the uniqueness of it and the performances and the, the human story. At its and heart. the ambition of it all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're cramming a and lot the- in here. And I think that's why I will give it five because wow. like I, said, I felt that way. I felt if I, if you'd asked me after I saw it in March, I probably would have said like Jeff, like four and three quarters, you know, but just seeing it again and the joy that I felt watching it the first time I got that out of this film again. And it's definitely the kind of movie that I can see myself coming back and watching over and over and over again and like my whole family we loved this film so you know we were all so excited the first time we saw it and we were the same degree of excited the second time we saw it all right sound the fanfare we got ourselves a five bucket movie to add to the list it's been a while so um let's move from everything everywhere all at once and go a few years back to Kung Fu Hustle, and we'll be back after the concession stand. So join us. Mr. Projectionist, stop the show. Here's great news you ought to know. We've just got a shipment of taste thrilled treats, all tip top quality and delicious eats. There are hot dogs and popcorn and candy galore. There's soft drinks and coffee and a whole lot more. So direct your steps to our refreshment stand to enjoy the finest snacks in all the land. All right, we're back and we're talking Kung Fu Hustle. Now, Christina, this was your pick after Mm -hmm. you had seen the first time, Everything Everywhere All at Once. 
And this is because there's a few reasons. When I first saw Kung Fu Hustle, which interestingly actually saw at the exact same theater where I saw everything everywhere all at once, um, just, you know, uh, 18 years apart. The first time I saw Kung Fu Hustle, I had the exact same walking on air feeling that I had leaving the theater after everything everywhere all at once. I felt like it was so, it played with so many existing tropes of Kung Fu films, but at the same time, it was something completely fresh. It was completely new. It had this like insane energy that I loved. And um, I ended up going back to see it in the theater twice more because I loved this movie so much. I own it on DVD. I watch it all the time. This is just one of my all-time favorites. I felt that tonally, it could sort of match the energy of everything everywhere all at once. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I remember seeing Kung Fu Hustle in the theater as well and loving it. And for one reason or other, I haven't seen it since that first theatrical viewing. Um, It's not like I didn't like it, but it just never came across my radar again. And that's unfortunate because I think that this movie should be held in higher regard. Not that it's not, you know, lauded, but, you know, I think it should get all the press that something like The Matrix does on its 20th anniversary or something. Like a bigger deal should be made about it. I agree. I agree. Because this is just such an incredibly clever film. Again, just kind of loaded with film references, all the stuff that Stephen Chow loves that he kind of crammed into this movie. Such an amazing, amazing cast of kind of legendary martial arts actors that he's got here, even in small parts. The opening sequence, like, sort of sold me right from the start when I saw this film, because it's so, it's so gorgeous, this sort of rise of the axe gang that he plays out in this, you know, little montage where so you see this little gang beating up a commissioner of police. And I love the sign in there, super crime fighters, the crocodile gang. And then they come out of the police station and they're confronted with this very large gang, the axe gang. And the leader of the crocodile gang throws up this flare to get everybody else to come. And then the leader of the axe gang, whose name is Brother Sum, says, you know, don't bother. We already recruited all your men. And then they take down the crocodile gang. And then you sort of see this rise of the axe gang in power. And it's played out through all these like different still shots of various crimes they committed. And it's intercut with this beautiful, beautifully choreographed dance of Brother Sum starting off by himself with his axe, and then all the gang members kind of come in and join him slowly over the course of the 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 kind of opening. It's almost like a little prologue before you get to the actual action of the film. It's so, so unexpected. You move to this place called Pigsty Alley, which was like sort of the it's sort of the big set of the film and most of the action takes place here and Stephen Chow said he actually had designed this based on like this very cramped apartments he lived in when he was a kid in Hong Kong. I read this because and I was looking for references to this set because when I saw this in the theater and it just hammered home when I watched it again that it reminds me of the cutaway um, of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Mm -hmm. So it's very reminiscent of that, you know, although it does cut away, obviously this opening is not does not take place in Pigsty Alley. And there's other scenes that do not take place in Pigsty Alley. But I could almost see it as like a a one set theatrical presentation, you know, Mm -hmm. where the characters are just on this Mm -hmm. set. Yeah, I mean, you could you could totally see that. And like I said, the vast majority of the action does take place there. And it's incredibly it's incredibly complex because, you know, as a director, you have to think about like you're doing all this action in this large space with all of these people performing various tasks. And in this whole movie, there's always stuff happening in the background. Yeah. Like every pretty much every shot, there's something else to see the whole <laughs> The sort of inciting action of the film is these two characters, these two sort of loser characters. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They go to try to scam a haircut, basically, out of 
you know, this barber in Pig's Eye Alley. They try to pretend that they're members of the Axe Gang mm. and they try to like get a free haircut and shake this kid down for money. Who it's apparently cannot haircut. afford a belt because this kid's <laughs> buttocks, his butt, his pants. buttocks are com- always hanging out of his pants. There you go. He was ahead of his time, by the way. <laughs> Stephen Chow's character, he's like, he's amazingly fast on his feet in terms of like fast talking. And he's trying to like talk his way out of it. And then the various members of Pig Sayali come to confront him. And he spontaneously throws a firecracker, which blows up the hat of an actual member of the Axe Gang. And this sets off the action of the whole film (laughs) where the axe gang comes in steven child's character says oh well you know i'm one of you and basically laying the blame for the firecracker on the people in pig's eye alley and then because the axe gang starts to threaten the people there these three martial arts masters who'd been living undercover (laughs) Um, the tailor, the baker, and the coolie all co- sort of throw off their disguises and fight the axe gang to defend the people in the in Tixti Alley. So this and- is a lot also a lot to take in in the first 10 minutes of this movie. You're like, what? Now, who's this? Who's this? Who's this? But mm-hmm. what we haven't talked about yet is before the actual axe gang shows up mm-hmm. and they're scamming the haircut, the Pigsty Alley comes to the aid of the barber. Singh comes out. He's like, I'll fight any one of you. Right. And like the one guy stands up and he's 10 feet tall. Not you. Sit down. Yeah, right, sit down. Four eyes. I'm, I'll fight you. And then he gets up and he's like Arnold. He's like, sit back. No, I didn't mean you. I right. meant I meant that kid over there. And then he looks like Arnold. So you're thinking to yourself, because it's not revealed yet that these are not actual Axe Gang members. Th- these guys are pretty inept to be in an Axe Gang. And mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> then finally, you know, then the, the real gang shows up. Be like, oh, OK, this that was probably my favorite sequence is. And this is hilarious. This work works on an action movie level it works on a comedic level it crosses genres very easily yes and also i will say that i am always very touched by his story with the lollipop girl i find it very very touching because it turns out that sing was when he was a little kid he bought like this supposed martial arts manual from a con man man. (laughs) who and then he became convinced that he was you know he was a gifted kung fu genius and he went to try to defend this little girl who was being beaten up by bullies for they were trying to take her lollipop of course he fails and then they humiliate him and it sort of like sets the whole course of his life because he failed at this one thing Again, there's sort of like so many great Kung Fu tropes in this movie. So like you have the boy who's a Kung Fu genius, of course, it turns out, spoiler alert, he actually is a Kung Fu genius. Um, His chi flow was just blocked or something. Um, (laughs) And, um, you know, you have the villagers who are like secretly Kung Fu masters because the landlord and the landlady are also secretly Kung Fu masters. The slum queen. Um, You have the blind assassins, which is like such a stereotypical Kung Fu trope. Um, you but, have it's, like, but it's the Blues Brothers. The, <laughs> it's Jake and Elwood Blues. Yes, but also, like, if you watch any Kung Fu movie, there's always, like, some blind swordsman who's, you know, actually a master, master at, at his thing, at his craft. You also have, like, the gang that's terrorizing the town, right? And the people have to overcome this. It, you know, it, it also, it has, like, this strongly unhinged kind of looney tunes quality oh, oh straight up roadrunner cartoon and something well, yeah whenever the the landlady comes into it yeah. it, mm-hmm. it goes right into gonzo cartoon land you know oh, it's roger rabbit each, it's, when they're chasing <laughs> each other forget it because you were talking about how um they cast martial arts legends mm-hmm. the landlord i thought this was fascinating was bruce lee's body double yeah back you in know the day. i mentioned stunt him double yeah when we watched shang chi because he plays Master Guangbo, the archer, in Shang Chi. He's in Shang Chi. Yeah, I didn't remember. I mentioned so, it when right. we when we watched it because I was like, "Oh, Yun was," and that's because he's yeah, he's a legend, and he's 
amazing when he fights because he's almost like rubber. Pretty funny. I actually wrote in my notes, old man goes Shang-Chi on their asses. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what's sort of interesting because like when it comes down to it, you see that the landlord and the landlady actually care about each other and that their yeah. fights are almost staged as practice so they can spar like which is interesting you know something you kind of notice the second time second third whatever time around like oh well they're actually sparring in secret sort of making it look like it's Mm, a fight Mm. it's a fight but there's just so many just really fun unexpected moments in this film and like i said i i'm always very touched by the story with the lolly with the lollipop girl the little mute girl especially at the end i cry every single time when the two of them appear to each other as they did as children i think it's so so sweet and they're running a lollipop shop at yeah. the end yeah yeah, yeah that's cute I will um, say the uh, the musical battle was uh, much more entertaining than the Doctor Strange. I I was going to ask you, Jeff, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you were more satisfied <laughs> yes, with this yes, musical very battle. Much so. Very much so. You mean you like it better when there's like scary ghosts with swords coming out of the? Yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that they take out easily the three masters because at that point Singh yeah, hasn't right. stepped up yet, right? Yeah. So he's not even close to being the the kung fu master that he is at the end. Like, how are they going to beat these two guys? And then the landlady comes out. Mm-hmm. with the lion's roar handily wipes them out and then suddenly the landlady and the landlord are in the car with the i love that <laughs> <laughs> so they just up here <laughs> and then she kind of does this little silent threat where she cracks her knuckles yes. yeah. threatens brother sum and he's so scared when she gets out of the car his hand is shaking and then they have to go and get the beast and they decide to use sing to to get him out and they tell him he can be part of the axe gang if he does this task Mm -hmm. and i love it when he's going to the asylum because there's like this threatening storm cloud above the asylum you know like these circling clouds and then he goes inside and he sees the shining blood coming down the hallway Mm -hmm. from the room where the beast is and then he opens the door and you see this completely nondescript man in his underwear yeah i know i was like the beast is larry david that's that's (laughs) (laughs) He is beastly, by the way. I wonder if uh, M. Night uh, borrowed the the concept of the beast for uh, for Split. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Mm. Maybe he did. I don't remember James McAvoy's character having a frog style, though. That was pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty. Did he run like a frog? That was glass. So now here's the, the, the mystical portion of it. Sing, you know, like you said, he had some kind of writer's block throughout his life. And now he's it opens up and he's got these martial arts powers. But he also has like Wolverine healing powers, because yeah. at the beginning, you see him go into that street light and he's like hulking out in there while he's healing. And then the beast pounds his head into the ground and he's a bloody pulp. <laughs> yeah. And he comes back from that as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you got to take it all with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. That's a, ab- absolutely. The top, uh... Well, the fast recovery is clearly supposed to be a sign that like he has these superpowers and that they're sort of latent within him. And eventually he'll come into his mm. his abilities and, you know. I love at the end when he sort of gently puts the landlord and landlady into the chairs and he's like, just stay here. And then they're watching him fight and they're like, he's about the age our son would be if he studies hard, he could grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. But yeah, he's referred to as the one. This even has more over Matrix references while, you know, he's taken out the hordes of Axe Gang members, very Mr. Smith-esque. Mm-hmm. And he's got the... Just like um, Bruce Lee, he ends up without his shirt at the end of the movie. (laughs) So, yeah, this is just a movie that I love, that I've always, always loved. When I saw Everything Everywhere all at once, it this it immediately reminded me of this film and the feelings that I had when I when I saw this film. And I just think it's got it's got a like a fairly tight story, all things considered. It seems like a lot happens, but they do it like in a relatively short running time. Yeah, it's tight. It's really Mm -hmm. tight. I know you're probably aware of this, but Brother Sum, the leader of the Mm -hmm. Axe Gang, named after the boss character in Infernal Infernal Affairs. Infernal Affairs, yes. Yeah. (laughs) Nice callback. You guys know how I feel about Infernal Affairs. (laughs) Sing is told with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Spider-Man you know, when he does the Malone line from Untouchables also. You know, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's uh, actually a lot going on here. I'm really, really fond of the music, too. I think the music is great. Yun Kui, play the landlady. I love the story. She accompanied her friend to the auditions for this role. And because she was standing off smoking a cigarette and had a, a, a certain look on her face, apparently. She had her they, hair up in curlers? I don't know if she had her hair up in curlers, but Where she won move? She won over the filmmakers just by being there. That is so I wonder funny. if that was premeditated on her part. I'm just going to stand over uh, here with uh, a cigarette. Pretend and I as, don't care. You pretend, pretend I don't, I don't care. care. I don't want any part of your movie. You're perfect. Yep. And it mm. worked and it worked. She was a Bond girl as well. I was going to say, I hope that you noticed that she was uh, in oh, The Man with the that. Golden Gun. I'm going to have to go back and look for her now in The Man with the Golden Gun. So, all right. Uh, Bill Murray was a big champion of this movie. He called it a supreme achievement of the modern age in terms of comedy. James Gunn has called it the greatest film ever made. <laughs> wow. That's, pretty, that's high praise. So what do we think? What kind of buckets would we give to Kung Fu Hustle? I'll go, I'll go solid four. It's very, it's fun, it's creative. Visually, it's very cool to look at, so four. All right, no, I'm going to go four as well. So I'm, at this moment in time, I'm putting it on an equal level with everything, everywhere, all at once. I loved it. I thought it was really, really funny. Even as a comedy, I think it's really successful. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to laugh, you will laugh if you watch Kung Fu Hustle. Yeah, when the landlady takes off her shoe and starts beating him with it, like he's a recalcitrant child. It's just like, it's... It's so funny. It's just like I said, so much about this is so fun. Just like with everything everywhere at once, so unexpected in so many ways. And um and of course I'm gonna put this on the same level as everything everywhere at once. Wow. I, I have loved this movie pretty much since I've seen it. Um and this is a movie that's only gotten better for me as the years have gone by. So this I feel like this is like our um our Bang Joon Ho episode, where it's a double five. For a double me. five. Okay. Yeah. Ten, ten buckets. <laughs> yep. Yep. But that was this was actually when Jim asked me a long time ago to like make a list of five bucket movies. This was, this on, was there. on there. This was on there. This yeah. was on there. All right. Yeah. So we've covered it now. Mm-hmm. Kung Fu Hustle. As I was watching this and then uh, Singh reveals himself to be a martial arts master, I'm like, well, maybe that's the hustle. He's hustling people <laughs> into thinking that he's not a martial arts master and he really is. Next week has a lot to live up to then. But before we get there, let's talk about what else we did this week. Yeah. So as I mentioned, and Jeff asked about this, so I went to see Men. Um, I kind of wish you guys had seen it because... Um, I feel strongly that Jeff would hate this movie. <laughs> oh, great. Awesome. That's a ringing endorsement right there. <laughs> but I loved it beca- because. Well, wait a second. Yeah. Please don't spoil I won't anything. Spoil, I won't spoil plot points. Okay. okay. But I will say that in a large part, this film is interpretive and it relies on you to pay attention to stuff that's happened. And yep, I'll hide it. Yeah, and Jeff hates that kind of movie, and I love that kind of movie. So I will also say I have never felt so scared for a character in any movie I've ever watched before. Because the thing that Alex Garland does, I think, very brilliantly in this film is capture the sense of that so many women have that you are not safe in the world because you are surrounded by men. By men. And I was really, really impressed with the way he got into that feeling. I don't like that typecasting. I thought it was, again, just like with everything everywhere at once, it's a swing for the fences. I think it's probably more divisive than everything everywhere at once. Mm. Um, But I loved it. I loved it. Interesting. Well, um, and Jeff brought this up uh, earlier that some of these smaller films Um, that aren't huge box office successes out of the gate um, really find their audience when they hit streaming. The Northman, for example, is now trending heavily 
because you can see it on Peacock um, if you yeah. have the premium Peacock. So I think that the it's there's still room in our schedule once it does, whenever it does drop on streaming for us to cover it. And I think more people may have be watching it at that point. I'm there there may still be an ex machina. I watched it. And I wrote notes for it. So. Okay. For so, well, well, ex machina. well, keep yeah. those notes because uh, I yeah. think that we still uh, there, there, there's still room in our schedule for men Oscar whenever it Isaac. drops on uh, on streaming. I just think it, knowing the kinds of movies that okay. I like and the kinds of movies that you like, yeah, but there I, are, there's listen, there's some crossover. I think that there are elements to this movie that will infuriate you. <laughs> well, if you're going to tell me all men are bad. And that we're all out to chase down women and just do them harm, then yeah, I got an issue with it. That's not what the movie is saying, but it okay. definitely captures that feeling that a lot of women have that they're not safe. Mm. Yeah. I think some of us guys are not. Yeah. I feel I'm not safe. I, was I don't. Say. I don't like men. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they are overrated, by the way. But yes. my, I mean, I mean it. It's been a long time since I watched a movie where my heart was actually pounding, but I was scared for her, oh. like really scared for her, because you just don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I won't like it. <laughs> okay, so Jamie, I, go next. Uh, go yeah, I'll bring up uh, Miss Marvel. You're going to talk about that too. Yep, I just yep. watched it last night. Kamala Khan, you know, another alliterative hero in the vein of Peter Parker, and Kamala Khan. Love, love this show. The first episode anyway. Um, again, it's another Marvel show that I can sit and watch with my son. He loved it as well, which was very gratifying. So and I know that this series is going to lead into the next Captain Marvel movie. Um, but it's a very Peter Parker-esque story of, a you know, a downtrodden high school student who is Kamala Khan in this case, who is a fan girl, a stan, as they the kids like to say these days, after Captain Marvel. And the whole plot of the first episode is her wanting to go with her best friend to an Avengers con. I don't think these people who wrote this have ever been to a convention, by the way, because that is not how conventions work. But I will agree with you. This was brilliant. This was so well executed and you, you can't help but compare it to Peter Parker and, and this whole idea of this, you know, kid finding his way kind of a thing. But they do it much better. And the interaction with her and her her uh, her friend uh, Bruno. But like there's scenes where they're on the bikes and they're having this conversation and the graphics are playing out as graphics like like, like graffiti on the side of the the, the, uh, the buildings as she drives by or they're texting each other and you're seeing their responses written on the concrete mm-hmm. or in the neon lights. Very well executed. Mm-hmm. I thought this was fantastic. And the graphics oh. that you see are supposed to be her illustrations because she is yeah. an artist. And, yeah. yeah, so well done. I uh, it blew me away. I'm not expecting it. It is very Scott Pilgrim slash, uh, you know, we talked this, this kind of frenetic energy with uh, Mitchell versus the machines or, or even turning red where you're seeing this world through this young girl's eyes. And I, and I feel that they really kind of picked up on a lot of that stuff. Mm. When, when they were first showing the interaction between uh, Kamala and her best friend, Bruno, I thought that she was just joking when she said, Bruno, no, no, no. Like the song. Right. And in Kanto, I'm like, oh, his name really is Bruno, is Bruno. as the show. went on. Yeah. There's one other thing, actually. Uh, I always watch the, the Joe Bob Briggs last drive in and he hosted a movie called The Monster Club last week, which is a movie that I love. Has John Carradine, Vincent Price, Donald Pleasant. So it's star studded. It came out in the early 80s. So it was really past that time of those 70s style hammer anthology films but it's all based around a horror writer played by john carradine who encounters a vampire played by vincent price who um shows him kindness and lets him suck a little blood because vincent is down in, on his luck so to repay vincent him price, man. vincent price brings him into the monster club which is an elite club where all the monsters in london gather and I always loved it because I saw it on Channel 9 back in the day as a kid. I've never even heard of this. Never even heard of it. No, and apparently no. Joe Bob loves it as well. So he showed it. And I was so excited to see this on uh, again good. and see it on the Joe Bob show. Especially. So that's only on Shudder, right? I believe Shudder is also somehow affiliated with Amazon. So I believe you can see the Monster Club on Prime, oh, okay. if I'm not mistaken. All right, we'll look it up. 
Yeah. Uh, I want to bring up Shutter though, because uh, there's a new movie dropping and they just did two private screenings in New York. And I wish I could have gone uh, Phil Tippett, who is a legend in special effects, ILM, you know, one of the, one of the founding fathers, uh, he just created this stop motion movie called mad God. And I, pretty sure they're promoting the hell out of it but it is dropping on shutter it is okay i'll, yeah. I'll keep an eye out for it then. check it out i'm mm-hmm. hoping eventually it'll be available elsewhere like jeff to- did you think that i was going to say horrified american monsters for my other thing that i did this week no i actually thought you were going to say ms marvel because that's right up your alley that's oh no i haven't watched it yet yeah no. yeah well, I so i haven't watched moon knight either <gasps> like if we don't all sit down as a family to watch something well, I know your but, son's into Marvel yeah. stuff. Yeah, right? I know, I know. Henry, Henry's not spearheading this and, and right. sitting yeah. everybody down. Because you don't need to watch uh, Moon Knight in order to enjoy the hell out of this Ms. Marvel. Do you know what he really wanted to watch that took absolute first priority? Well, first we spent like a whole weekend watching Stranger Things, which was yeah. no mean feat because those episodes are long. No, but uh, you, um, you binge through them pretty quick. But um, and then, you know, we had to prioritize the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. So yeah, we, we talked a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm watching, watching a different episode every night of, of these four. various things. Are we all caught up? Did we watch episode? Four, yep, my watch. Of Obi-Wan? Yeah. Yes. OK, it literally is episode four. It is a new hope. Mic drop. It's <laughs> previously has been held captive on the- <laughs> It's the new hope. He's got to break into the Death Star to, to save Princess Leia. He literally does the same trick that he does when he when he's at the tractor beam to distract the, the stormtroopers. Well, she's I, very uh, adorable though. That she little is, actress who uh, plays Leia. I, I enjoyed the retread of New Hope then much better here than I did in The Force Awakens. Well, I will tell way. you in in talking with my son about this, and I started looking it up. Someone pointed out that every one of these episodes mirrors episode one, two, three, and four. So I can only assume that five and six will follow Empire and Jedi. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, but you talk about this little girl who plays Leia. There is a photo of Carrie Fisher. At that age, with a little bird, it was her pet parakeet named Lola. And this little girl looks pretty spot on to what Carrie Fisher looked like at that age. And they went out of their way to make that little robot thing Lola. So well played. Well played. But now it's tracking them. Yeah. Well, yeah. What did we learn in episode four? Yeah. They, they, they'd let us go. It's so, crazy. yeah, that was a little bit ridiculous, though. A little when, on and when some of the stuff is like Obi Wan like, had the big overcoat and she was walking uh, under it. Come on. Stop. Stop <laughs> so, it. But, but they do say at the end, we, well, I let them go, you know, yeah. so we could track them. Yeah, so we we're not them. that stupid. You... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Look that way. That, that's not them. He wasn't wearing a trench coat. But no, the big takeaway was that the tomb at the bottom. What, oh, what are they doing the, with those bodies? With all, the, with all the Jedis. I didn't really. I There's some people speculating on. Well, we did hear Quinlan Voss's name. So there was a good chance that we may see him. And are we going to see Liam Neeson before the end of this? You may no. hear him. I think you may hear him. You know, I'm still holding out hope that we're going to see Mace Windu. I'm going to cherish this hope forever. I don't believe he's dead. They didn't show him in the tomb, at least. They didn't show he's, him in the tomb. He's, he's lobbying hard to come back. And, and listen, if you can bring back Darth Maul after being chopped in two pieces, right. I'm pretty sure that you can save Mace Windu after getting his arms cut off. That's what I'm saying. Like, he yeah. didn't actually see him dead. And no, I, but he did throw him halfway across the city. Whatever. That can't be a good landing. But you Yeah, but you can live. stop your... He's a Jedi. He's a Jedi, yeah. He's got no hands. It doesn't matter. He has the power of the force. Doesn't uh, he have hands for yeah. the power of the force? <laughs> That's where he's it comes out of. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's still in a back to tank somewhere. You get somebody mm-hmm. a back to tank, you can fix all sorts of ills. Um, I'm just saying, I, I'm still holding out hope that Mace Windu is going to show up. That is the yeah, dream listen, of my that life. Awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> I, I do feel that Hayden Christensen being used is a waste right now. I know because you're not really seeing him. No, and I I understand it is a stunt double in some of those suit fights. So it's not even him doing all this stuff. Well, we got two more episodes, so maybe they'll somehow work him in without the suit. You know, even if it's in makeup, if he don't don't have the helmet on. I do love the fact that they are both haunted by Padme, though. I love this just kind of filling out and, you know, just kind of gapping these two stories from the prequels to... I just want Mace Windu to show up and say there are too many mother effing Siths 
<laughs> on this mother <laughs> effing base. <laughs> He's got to have little claw hands. Maybe he'll just shove a lightsaber. He'll go like full on uh, Ash. Just put a lightsaber there instead. Lightsaber on the end. There you just go. Attach it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, two episodes left. So yeah. There you go. So what are we doing next week in our next watching, episode? Watching Obi Wan episode <laughs> five. <laughs> Uh, not for the main uh, brunt of our episode, at least. We are oh, going we could, back to the whole episode. We're going back to Jurassic World. I am so excited for this. And I know that Christine has already seen it, so I can't even throw out speculation. Poker face, please. Poker face. Oh, Do not it. even re- don't re- even reveal. I know. I just want to say right now, and this is the one thing that I really liked Jurassic World. I liked what they did. They they took John Hammond's we'll talk about this because you can't talk about this movie without talking about the entire franchise and Jurassic Park is a five bucket movie for me it is about as lean and there is not a single scene wasted in that movie you get right into the plot you get the storyline boom gone wasted not bringing Lexi and Timmy back into this universe and I think if they don't do it here I'll be very disappointed they've got to be in their 40s by now right Yes. You got one as a dinosaur expert and the other one was a friggin' computer. Ex- oh, follow we'll up. see. Christina follow knows. Your, follow Christina up on your knows. Father's uh, dying dream there. Well, I, 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 I will say that in preparation to watch the new movie yesterday, I watched the whole franchise this week. Wow. And I started re listening to the audiobook, the original mm-hmm. audiobook, which I have not read the book since. I almost, novel. that was almost my first book choice, knowing that we were going into this. Um, I haven't, I have not read the book since it came out. So, you know, it's been like what, 30, 30 years or whatever. Um, and there were many, many things I'd forgotten about the, it is vastly different. Some of the stuff they picked up on in later movies, but, but actually there's one big thing from the book that is played very minorly in the first film, but actually comes into larger play in this current film which is sort of okay. interesting Alrighty. so we'll talk about that mm-hmm. right. we get a zombie ned uh, there's no zombie nedry mm. <laughs> um and we're going full Crichton. yeah next week Crichton verse so not only are we talking about jurassic world we're talking west world as well the 1973 original we're not even attempting the hbo series so uh, um, the the brilliant first season uh i don't know what the hell you're doing now <laughs> subsequent season yeah i gave up after I, I, episode I, one season two i'm like i'm out i can't do yeah, this West- anymore <laughs> <laughs> would you waste away jeffrey right i don't know what to do i did but, hear marsden's coming back though but that's next week yeah jurassic westworld. world and westworld yule brenner robot yule brenner would ask for anything more his iconic role king and i <laughs> westworld <laughs> it is it's true so uh come back we'll be here thanks everybody thanks for listening <laughs> thank bye. you bye, bye. Hey, everybody. If you like what you just heard, be sure to follow TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Kind on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or whatever you listen to your favorite podcasts on. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and then share it with your fellow movie nerd friends. It means the world to us and helps our listenership grow. You can also find us on all of the socials, Instagram and Twitter at TMI underscore podcast 2018. We're on Facebook and YouTube as well. Just look for the popcorn bucket. You can help support this show by visiting our T public page for some TMI branded goodies, such as hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, and stickers. Tpublic.com slash TMI confessionals, all one word. A five-star review would be incredibly nice as well. I'm just saying. Thanks again for listening. We truly appreciate you. Be sure to come back next week. We'll save some popcorn for you. All I have to say is if the van is a rockin', don't come (laughs) knockin'.